going to be talking about carrying the Declaration of Independence. And this is what we're going to look at today. We're going to talk about the document itself, not so much the um, impact of it, but why was it significant in 1776? How do we care for it after the revolution had ended and after it had been signed? And how is it significant for us now? So this is the boring part where we look at dates. Most people understand that we celebrate July 4th, but if you look at the dates that are on here, you'll see that on July 2nd, the Continental Congress that met in Philadelphia voted for independence. July 4th, what we actually celebrate is the approval of the wording on the Declaration of Independence and they printed Dunlap broadsides. We're gonna talk about that a bit more. And then there were live readings in Philadelphia of the Declaration to the populace of Philadelphia. But after July 18th, um, New York agreed to the wording on the Declaration. They assented and Congress decided that we needed an engrossed copy or what they said, called the signed original sole document. And they proposed to gather in Philadelphia on August 2nd to sign that document. So it started with the drafts on that July 2nd, they decided that they needed some wording in order to present to the king about leaving the crown. And of course, Jefferson, as you know, was assigned to do the drafting. He had at his immediate disposal, five editors. It was Ben Franklin, John Adams, uh, Roger Sherman and Robert Livingston and, or four editors rather. And the, the five of them worked on the original drafts. It was Jefferson who was chosen to do the writing because he was considered the most hip at the time. Uh, John Adams would have liked to have done it. Julie, I know you're related to the Adams, but John Adams would have liked to have done it, but he was too formal, they felt, for the populace to understand the writing. So Jefferson did these drafts. The draft you see on the right-hand side is in his handwriting, and that is a draft that is currently housed at the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. But once that wording was approved, and having been a novelist, I really feel for Jefferson, he ended up with a total of 55 editors because there were 56 men in Congress. Uh, once the wording was approved, they decided that they would create these Dunlap broadsides. Broadsides were typeset on one side and put onto a wall in public places or sent around the country for viewing or allowed readings. And the Dunlaps were the first ones to print typeset a copy of the declaration. And these versions, you can tell what they are because they have only John Hancock, the president of Continental Congress and the secretary, Charles Thompson, only their two names are typeset on the Dunlap copies. 200 of them were made. As of 1989, there were 24. And then a gentleman went into a flea market to buy a frame that he liked and he got it home and took the backing off the frame. And lo and behold, there was a Dunlap broadside in behind it. It was authenticated and sold at Sotheby's for a shocking 8.14 million. For anyone who watched the Golden Globes last night, uh, Norman Lear was honored for his work. And I bring him up because he is the man who paid the 8. 1.14 million for that declaration. He also had a special truck made and had the declaration tour around the country so people could see it because he said it was the people's document. So the Dunlap broadsides had those typeset names, but as I mentioned, Congress decided in late July that they would regather on August 2nd and sign one document. And the reason they did this was because a lot of them, as you see here, were lawyers or merchants or farmers, and they understood the value of a contract. And if you are 13 colonies and you are about to leave the crown and you want to ensure that the king cannot divide you, the best way to do that is to sign a contract. So when we see this version of the Declaration of Independence, this is the unanimous contract that they all signed. It was done in calligraphy. It's rather large, so it's almost two feet by almost three feet. And I define it as a separation agreement and a marriage contract. We agreed to leave the king and we agreed to come together as colonists. 
But what is the content here? So the content for the declaration is broken into sections. And if there are one or two of you in here who've seen me speak before, you know I love to describe this as the biggest Dear John breakup letter in history. And for any women who've written teenage breakup letters to a boy, it follows the same format. So the green section in a teenage breakup letter, the opening is what? It's always kind of an outline of what the teenage girl thought a, um, thought a relationship was going to be. So in the preamble of the declaration, this is what we thought a government that was over a populace, this is what we thought the ideal would be. It's life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's all men are created equal. These are the lines that we typically quote are from the preamble. And then in a teenage breakup letter, after writing out what we think the ideal is, what do we women do? We list all the things the boy did wrong. And that is the biggest section in here, the big blue section, or what we call the grievances. And these are all the grievances that the colonists had against the king. And they are also what the boy king did wrong because they all almost all start with the word he. So he quartered troops in our homes. He, uh, put troops on our shores during peacetime. There are a number of, there are 27 different grievances that we outlined against the king. And that is followed by the pink section there, which is the declaration. The declaration also includes what they call the vain appeals. The teenage girl, what does she do? She says, you know, despite repeated requests for you to improve this relationship, we so still suffered repeated injuries. We use almost the same language there. And then we have the actual declaration of separating plus the signature section. And for me with my book, my book is about a gentleman who acquires seven signatures of people who were not in that room on August 2nd. And this is who was missing. So just imagine right now that I ask you all to reassemble here tomorrow at exactly the same time. We might not all be able to make it and we have the technology to make that much easier. But in 1776, when all of the men were in Philadelphia on July 4th to vote on separation and on that wording, it's a month later, they're supposed to come back into Philadelphia. Well, out of the 56, seven can't make it. Richard Henry Lee and George Wythe of Virginia had both gone home due to illness. Richard Henry Lee, it was his own, and George Wythe, it was his wife. Lewis Morris and Elbridge Gerry, or Elbridge Gerry, depending on where you're from, these two gentlemen had been sent by Congress up to New York to Harlem Heights, where George Washington and the Colonial Army were, and they were tasked with taking an evaluation of what the troops needed in terms of clothing and munitions and food and reporting back to Congress. Uh, amount of funds that were going to be required. You probably recognize Elbridge Jerry from that horrible thing we all deal with still called gerrymandering. Uh, he was the first one to do it. And when he redrew his district to make it more palpable and get himself into office, it looked like a salamander. So we put Jerry and salamander together and we have gerrymandering. Oliver Wolcott was the most Northern of the men who didn't make it back. He too uh, claimed to have gone home for illness. Matthew Thornton, we're gonna talk about him here in a minute. Please note he's from New Hampshire. And Thomas McCain or Thomas McKeon, depending on where you're from, he was the last one to sign the document. But based on the letters and the research that I've done, it's if in fact it was carried to them, there is no record of whether that document was carried or whether or not the men came back into Philadelphia to sign it. But if indeed it was carried and there is some evidence it might have been, uh, then these are the locations that those seven men were from as far south as Yorktown, Virginia, all the way up to Litchfield, Connecticut. How was it carried? is a big question. A document like this, uh, you, you assume it would be rolled. We see them that way in movies a lot of the time, they have it rolled. And on the back of the original declaration, it has the original declaration, July 4th, 1776 is written on it. However, it would most likely have been folded. The gentleman on the left in this is John Nagy. If you've watched the TV show Turn, he's responsible for a lot of the spy craft research that went into developing Turn. 
And John Nagy and I wrote back and forth about how would I exactly move a document that's two feet by three feet. And he said that you would not have rolled it, you would have folded it. And most likely you would have put it in what was called a haversack or a possibles bag, uh, depending on your phrasing from the time period. But if it was a mail carrier, a document like that would have been put in a linen haversack. Well, linen is just too um, porous for carrying something as important as the declaration. So it most likely would have been leather. You may recognize this gentleman on the right as Ben Franklin. However, he is my friend, Bill Ochester, who is a reenactor in Philadelphia. And he said, nothing ruins um, a tour with a reenactor like a set of keys and a cell phone. So he had this leather haversack made by the Tanners at Colonial Williamsburg here in Virginia, an historic park. And this satchel was made specifically for his outfit. However, um, before we got going today, we were all talking about um, we were all talking about the John Adams series and in the John Adams series, a few years later, after Bill Ochester had this bag made, he noticed that the John Adams character was carrying the exact same bag. Um, the producers of John Adams, the series had gone to Colonial Williamsburg and asked them for a pack for John Adams to carry and they recreated this one for him. So how do we know that seven men were not at the formal signing? Uh, there are several proofs, it turns out, showing why they were not there. The order of the names is one of them. So if you look at those signatures at the bottom of the Declaration of Independence, aside from really horrible spatial reasoning, one of the things you learn is that the men did have a reason in the way that they signed it. So over here on the far left are the gentlemen from Georgia, the most Southern colony, and they signed from South to North. So as you go through here, here you are in Virginia and you wander all the way up through New Hampshire, all the way to Connecticut. Now, as I mentioned a couple screens ago, New Matthew Thornton was from New Hampshire. But if you will look, the gentleman from New Hampshire and the gentleman from Massachusetts did not leave him enough room to add his name. And that is because Matthew Thornton was not elected unto, to Congress until September of 1776, almost a month and a half after the formal signing. It was up to each colony turning state to decide how many representatives were best suited to sign the declaration and New Hampshire decided at the last minute they needed one more. So they added Matthew Thornton and most historians believe that he signed that document in late November when he first came into Philadelphia, uh, which would have put him almost second to last in terms of signing. Thomas McCain, as we said, was the last one, but he had enough room over here. So the order uh, with Matthew Thornton being out of order is one of the ways that we know. Uh, the letters of course were the primary way that I pieced together where the men were, but proof number three has to do with this inkwell. If you go to the state house today in Philadelphia where the men had gathered to sign the Declaration of Independence, you will see on one of the tables this silver inkwell. And if anyone ever asks you, do you think the men knew that they were making history when they did this event when they had the signing, you can say yes and point to this inkwell. Benjamin Franklin had it crafted by another man named Philip Singh. He was a silversmith. He had it crafted for the sole purpose of signing historic documents for the new colonies. They filled this inkwell with ink, gall ink made by a gentleman named Timothy Matlack, who was also the calligrapher who did the original drafting on that sole copy. And all the men on August 2nd who were in attendance signed using pens with this ink and this inkwell. However, over time, not all the signatures have faded at the same rate, indicating that there were other signatures from those seven members who did not use this inkwell. And the final proof of knowing that they were not all together is related to this copy of the declaration on the right hand side and there is a woman's name on it. And this is the part where most of the women in the room sit up and they were curious what this means. It is related to this woman, Mary Catherine Goddard. She was a printer in Baltimore in 1777. She was also the first female 
postmistress of Baltimore. And because she held that title as the colonies became the United States, she was also the first federally female paid employee of the United States. But as the calendar turned from 1776 to what they called the year of three sevens, the Congress decided that perhaps some of the reason that the men were leaving the colonial army had to do with the fact that they didn't know who they were standing behind or who they were fighting with. And so Congress decided for the first time that they would typeset an entire copy of the Declaration of Independence with all their names below it. And they put out a call for a volunteer and Mary Catherine Goddard, who was running a print shop, it was her brother's print shop, but he was a bit of a drunk and he was off gallivanting around the colonies, a little uh, despondent because Benjamin Franklin had been given the post of Postmaster General over him. So he was off gallivanting around. Mary Catherine Goddard ran the print shop. She volunteered and made 200 copies. But when we look at the typeset names down below, Mary Catherine Goddard has most of them in there. She's realigned Matthew Thornton with his group from New Hampshire. Um, and you may notice the name Josiah Bartlett here in New Hampshire. If that's familiar to any of you who've watched the West Wing, it's because President Bartlett on the West Wing is named as a descendant of Josiah Bartlett. But you will notice that Thomas McCain is missing from the Delaware grouping. That is because as you typeset something from an original document like this, you line by line, word by word, letter by letter, typeset these little letters into place. And it is not really your job to determine what's missing or what needs to be added. So Thomas McCain is missing as of January 18th, 1777. And uh, Thomas McCain himself later on uh, indicated that we should not be celebrating July 2nd or July 4th as a country. We should be celebrating the day the last signature went on to the declaration because that was actually the contract that united the colonies. But then in his letter, he fails to mention where or when he actually affixed his signature. But thankfully for us, Mary Catherine Goddard let us know it was her or she who created these, uh, these broadsides. So the Goddard broadsides actually have her name on them, which I really love that she did that. So once those signatures finally went down onto that document, the question is what happened to it? How did we care for it during the remaining years of the revolution and afterward? According to the National Archives, which we'll get to, that currently houses the Declaration, according to their website, they said it probably stayed with the Secretary Charles Thompson and most likely moved whenever the Congress moved. Uh, but there isn't a definitive answer for some of those early years during the revolutionary period. But post-revolution, it didn't get cared for very well, unfortunately, and we'll go over how. So it was rolled at this point, but you can still see the creases there in that version, which shows the back of it. Um, you can still see the creases where it had been folded in, into thirds and then into thirds again. As I said, it stayed with the Congress and for a while it stayed in the Library of Congress until in 1814 when the British came storming back into the Capitol. In the War of 1812 when the British came into DC, the cannon fire caused such great smoke and billowing flames that they could be seen from 40 miles away, which is further than Leesburg, Virginia, um, or is about the distance of Leesburg, Virginia. And so the Declaration, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights were taken to a safe house at that time. When they came back into the Capitol, they stayed here at the State Department. It was a rather humid building. For any of you who have been in Washington, D.C. in the middle of summer, you know it is about 100 degrees and about 80% humidity with all that water coming off the Potomac. Um, and when it was transferred back to the State Department in 1814, this time it actually did make the journey in a linen haversack. By the mid 1800s, we had moved it to the patent office where I'm sorry to say it hung across from a window for a number of years, which if anyone one knows how to take care of historic documents, it's not exactly what you hope for. Uh, a few months after it was removed from the patent office to its new home at Independence Hall, it, uh, the patent office burned, so it just barely escaped a burning. 
In 1876, at the 100th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, they brought it back out. Again, they framed it and put it up in Independence Hall for all to see. So it was in a room with a lot of activity and a lot of people and really quite unprotected. And it went back to the State Department Library after that, where again, it hung in a room where smoking was permitted and there was often a fire and it hung over the fireplace. At least they moved it from the window, but it didn't fare better until Warren Harding came into office. President Harding in 1921 um, wrote an executive order transferring it to the Library of Congress. He also unfortunately ordered that it be kept dry and cool and the parchment that it is on is actually a pounded and taut animal skin. And animal skin, if it is too cool and not humid enough, it will shrink. It will expand if we have too much heat and too much humidity. So it needs ideal temperatures in order to remain the same. It stayed here at the Library of Congress for all the years between 21 and 1952, except for one small sojourn during Pearl Harbor attack. When Pearl Harbor was attacked and they were worried that more attacks were going to come on the continental US, uh, it was transferred to the building on the right, which is Fort Knox. The image you have there on the left is of the, the motorcade whisking the declaration out and the people saluting. Um, you can see some people in the um, passersby there saluting as it goes by. At this time, it was put into a case with acid paper, billboard, bronze, and lead, and it was a 150-pound case that it was transferred out of Washington, D.C. When it came back, it went back to the Library of Congress for a while until in 1952, it was transferred to the National Archives, where it still is today. However, by the time uh, 1952 came around, we had a lot more invested in the declaration. It was so much older, but the country really saw it more as an historic document and took better care of it. So as it was transferred, I'm just gonna read aloud the description of how it was transferred so you can see how much more effort we put into preparing and, and caring for these documents. So all the documents, the declaration, the constitution and the bill of rights, were transferred down the library steps through a line of 88 service women. Once they had been placed on mattresses inside a vehicle, they were accompanied by color guards, ceremonial troops, army band, the Air Force drum and bugle corps, two light tanks, four servicemen carrying submachine, gun, submachine guns, and a motorcycle escort in a parade down Pennsylvania and Constitution Avenues to the archives building. Both sides of the parade route were lined by Army, Navy, Coast Guard, Marine, and Air Force personnel. So clearly we had a lot more invested in it. But unfortunately, by the time it got there, it was in pretty terrible shape. And that is due in part to what happened back in 1823. Secretary of State John Quincy Adams Jr. Dear Julie is your family again. Um, he had recognized that the declaration was not being well taken care of. And he determined that if we didn't do something about it to make some really good legitimate copies of that original calligraphy version, that it would be destroyed before too long. So he hired William J. Stone, an engraver, to make a copper plate of the declaration so copies could be henceforth ever made. Uh, unfortunately, the process they used further damaged the declaration because what they do is they lay a metal plate down, uh, flood it with a chemical, and then lay the declaration over top with the ink side down, and then they peel the original declaration back, leaving some of the original ink on that copper plate, which they then trace and engrave. So in saving the declaration, he damaged it further. Uh, the image here that's on the right, if there are any daughters of the American Revolution here, this is a replica that was made from the original copper plate, and it is a massive version of the copper plate that hangs in the Daughters of the American Revolution headquarters in Washington, D.C. So by 1904 to 1942, this is about the state that the Declaration was in creased and cracked. It had a corner split off. Repair had included pasting it to a mounting at one point. 
A crack here, which you can see on the right, had been fixed with cellophane tape, which had turned the color of molasses. Um, the edges, because of some of the treatment that had been done to it, had begun to really turn. You can see that down here in the bottom and black and, and many of the signatures had faded to almost nothing. But it wasn't really until 1987 that a, a complete restoration of the document uh, was enacted through the National Archives. They gathered funding and experts together and reconditioned this and tried to piece it back together as best they could. So this is what the declaration looks like today. And as you can see, there's very little in terms of the signatures that we can find. So it's really an historic document now. They created the area in the rotunda when they fixed it in 1987. Um, most of us have seen this in the movie National Treasure with Nicolas Cage, where he tries to steal the Declaration of Independence in this very um, glass casing that's down here that you can see in the middle. It has the, the Declaration, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the Magna Carta are all housed in the rotunda now. It's a $3 million project. Uh, with a camera and computerized system that monitors the condition of the documents. It detects any changes in readability due to ink flaking, to shrinking of the document, expansion of the document, any ink transferring onto the glass that it's encased in. Um, it's recorded in very fine inch, one inch detail on a regular basis to ensure that each section of the declaration is doing well. And on the very first day, they opened this exhibition in uh, the rotunda at the National Archives. A tour group was going through and a woman looked in the casing and she saw a water bug in the document with the declaration. So they had to take it apart and redo it. But you notice what they also found as they were cleaning. You can see it down here. It's very clearly a handprint. So if, when people ask me what is on the back, there's only text on the back, but on the front is a faded handprint. By the time 1987 came around, there were new regulations about how you could restore documents and you cannot lift pieces off, which means we could not do DNA testing on any of that section. So it remains a mystery. If you'd like to really find out how the handprint got there or probably how the handprint got there, I should say, you can pick up a copy of my book. I, I guess as to how that got there. But I think more than um, handprints or faded signatures, what remains from the document is inspiration. Which brings me to this question of how is the document significant to us now? And as my take on it is that no, the document itself is not very significant to us right now. It is true that this document is an artifact uh, it is an historical record of all of those who decided that we should, in fact, start for the first time ever a country in which the leader is not born into the role, but could be anyone who ascends into that role. Uh, but because we have copies, the original document isn't as important to us. Also because it was eclipsed by legal operational documents. The Constitution and the Bill of Rights came years later in 1787 and 1789. And our operating with those documents almost made the declaration obsolete. However, we wouldn't have those documents without the original wording, especially in that preamble section. So I would say if the declaration holds a significance to us at this point, it is as a contract to uphold those tenants in the preamble. And they're all the ones that we quote. It's that all men are created equal. It says that we are endowed by their creator, not a creator, not God, it says their creator, which I think leaves it open to interpretation for religious freedom. Um, inalienable rights or unalienable as it was spelled on the original one. Uh, life, liberty and happiness. That is lifted from John Locke who said that we should be pursuing life, liberty and the pursuit of property. Jefferson changed it to happiness. And from all I've read, my take on this is that happiness is not just for me it's not an individual thing it is to lift all boats 
Uh, and in that way, if we look at happiness as something that we are striving for for all, then that means those who govern are do so at the consent of the governed. And if they do not uphold these tenants in this first preamble, that we do have the right to throw them off and find a new government. And I think this idea that uh, what is in that preamble as being significant is supported by what John Adams said after the revolution had ended and even after the War of 1812, that the radical change was in the hearts and minds of the people. It was not what happened on the battlefield. It was not necessarily what happened in terms of the country forming um, or separating altogether. It was really that so many Americans decided that there could be something better. And so the declaration really becomes more of a beginning. As I said, uh, my character George Wyth, one of the signers in my novel says, it was the match to the gunpowder that blew open wide the world. That document was the catalyst for more than 50 such other declarations since. For humanity, independence was and is a freedom often hard won by ordinary individuals like you and me who are moved to contribute during extraordinary times. So this is what I leave you with today is a question. If independence isn't granted and it's chosen and cultivated, how will you be carrying independence forward for all of us? I like to end with a little movie. Um, it's a book trailer that was made for my book that also kind of supports what we're talking about here today, how even one individual can make an extraordinary contribution. And then I'll take some Q and A. having me as your speaker today and as I said I'm going to um, stop the sharing and take some questions and I like to let people know too that if you are interested in learning how to research ancestors uh, more like an historical novelist does you can find me on YouTube I have a free uh, webinar I give on how to research women like an historical novelist um, or you can email me questions if you're a little shy today too, and I will answer them there.